uh, in the next 60 minutes or so, I want to introduce you to some uh, conceptual tools that may or may not be useful from modern philosophy of mind. Um, I'm not doing this for myself, I'm doing it for you. Uh, so I actually would like to encourage you to slam the brakes at any point uh, and interrupt me, but I've been told I should not do this um, because of the live stream. <laughs> so um, do signal to me if any of this uh, is crazy or too much, and then maybe after the break we can think of if any of this is helpful for the questions we are really interested in, so that clicker doesn't work. Right. Um, so. The first slide I think I'm going to show you um, comes from a time I've been in San Diego 18 years ago and I wrote this book, Being No One, and uh, at that time, which was published with MIT Press, don't ever try to read this, and uh, I brought, uh, can we, can you push it one more time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. After the break, we'll discuss the pen punishment, okay? <laughs> so this is one of the oldest slides on my computer, and it's from a popular neuropsychologist, uh, Vilayanu Ramachandran, who was at the time in San Diego. And a lot of the things pick up right where Anil left off. So you have heard already yesterday that some people with phantom limbs do not have the phantom limb gradually vanishing, as it were, into the stump, but they suffer from a paralyzed phantom limb um, and uh, <coughs> develop a cramping pain. And one problem is how do you, for medicine, eliminate a pain in a non-existing limb? So I had this patient who had a paralyzed limb for many years with pain in it. And uh, the setup shows an ingenious experiment. So the patient was asked, can you just hold both of your arms like this and make butterfly-like movements, like this, symmetrical? Uh, what is your phenomenology? What's your conscious experience? And the patients would say, oh, doctor, my, my phantom limb is paralyzed, my good arm moves. Then you would put in a mirror in the middle and say, can you do the same thing again and look at the mirror? And the patient would exclaim, doctor, doctor, my arm is plugged in again. I can use, I can volitionally control the phantom limb for the first time in more than a decade in some cases. You pull out the mirror to the top or you switch off the lights and the patient will be very disappointed and say, oh, it's paralyzed again. So the idea was that you could bring this, uh, if you could bring it under volitional control, you could perhaps dissolve the map uh, in the brain. And t here you see, so that is um, one, my first example for what I mean by a self-model. What moves, and I'm going to explain what that means, what moves in that experiment is what I call the phenomenal self-model. Phenomenal is philosophers speak for consciously experienced, the appearance, and a self-model is the model not of a thing, at the self, but that the system has of itself as a whole, and sometimes parts of its body model will be under control, and sometimes they will not be. So that moving phantom limb is one of my first example for what I mean by a conscious self-model in the brain. I think that's very intuitive, but if you've listened to Anil closely yesterday, you should already have um, noted that if that story is true, what you are experiencing as your own body right now is not your body, but the content of an image of the body in your brain, right? Um, so the slightly unsettling uh, point at the beginning, you're probably never directly in touch with your very own body. So here's a slightly less intuitive picture uh, with an amputation of one arm. Oops, now it worked. Or did you do that? Ah, see this? Illusion of control <laughs> is a technical term. <laughs> so you would trickle down, put drops of water on this amputated boy's face, and he would say, 
I have feeling water running down my thumb if the drop was in this region. If the drop was in this region, he would have the conscious experience of, oh, there's water running down my index finger or my pinky. That is also what I mean by a conscious self model. There's an experience of a sensation on my body surface. I own it. It's part of bodily self-consciousness, but that is less intuitive. But there are some ideas. So here you see these sensory regions that are mapped onto these regions in conscious experience, so to speak. And if you look into the brain, you see that there are regions that model parts of the body, like thumb, fingers, hand, wrist. And you see that the face region is adjacent to the hand region. The way the things are, the image of the body, uh, works in the brain is not as you would intuitively think of it. But then there's a very interesting, slightly speculative detail. Maybe um, many of you have seen that infants, fetuses, very often unborn babies have a position like this, right? So this is adjacent in the early development of probably also in the early development of the self-model in the brain of the unborn child. So what is a phenomenal self? That's again, it's the phen philosopher's ter term for a conscious self. The answer is the phenomenal self is what we normally call the conscious ego. It's the self as it is being subjectively experienced. Can one scientifically explain how such a phenomenal self emerges? The answer is yes, that's possible, because there is no such thing as a self. So the uncontroversial assumption at the beginning of this talk will be, my claim will be, that nobody in this room is a self or ever had a self. There are no such things. Um, what really exists is a PSM, a phenomenal self model. And I want to explain and give you many examples for what that is. So <coughs> keep going. Uh, a phenomenal self-model is what philosophers call a mental representation. That is an inner image of the person as a whole, not only involving body properties, but psychological properties like your emotions and social properties, your relations as well. It can be simultaneously analyzed on different levels of description. And I'm going to show you four of these. Uh, Anil talked about levels of description yesterday. So uh, one level of description is obviously the neurobiological level of description. That's what most of us in this room are not interested in. But there is a neuroscientific story to be told, right? So. I would claim that at any instant in time, your conscious self model is simply identical with some widely distributed activation pattern in the brain. That's one level of description. Maybe useful, maybe not. Another one is what philosophers call the representationalist level of description. Then conscious experience would be the content of something, the content of an image, for instance, right? So the standard of neuroscience is that if you have a dog on the retina, then there are all kinds of complex things happening. And every conscious percept has a neural correlate of consciousness. So the, the idea is that at any point in time, there will be one set of events in your brain that are sufficient to generate um, the conscious experience of these beautiful flowers there. You cannot make it smaller, but there will be one set if you could activate that you would reliably bring about the conscious experience of these flowers. Here's the, that was um, actually a picture from, can you go back one time from Los Angeles, uh, another early German researcher, Christoph Koch. So here you see somebody who sees a brain and what you can't really see is uh, that in this um, brain imaging uh, picture, there is an area of very high activity in back in the visual cortex while he sees that. So here the idea would be that that is somehow the neural correlate of the experience uh, 
of the seen brain in the consciously seeing brain. Of course, the real story is much more complicated. It's not localized and so forth. But one level of looking at it is conscious experiences are representations of something. That's, here's a, a next level that is interesting. There is a conscious and an unconscious self model. Most of the things we know about ourselves are things we only unconsciously know. Here the example would be psychosomatic diseases. I don't know if it has occurred to you if you hear about psychosomatics that it's actually complete garbage. Um, I mean, there is no psyche and no soma. Nobody could mean what that means. The idea is that mind-body um, interactions are interactions between the conscious level in your self-model and the unconscious level. So for instance, uh, 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 hurting uh, information may be come in on the level of your conscious self model. Somebody says, oh, you've put on weight again. And you try to repress that unattractive information, but you still have that unconscious self no no um, knowledge. This modulates processes uh, in the body. Caus is causally effective because it's implemented in the brain. For instance, it could lead to an immune suppression and you get infections more easily if there's all this push down negative information. So the self model of human beings changes all the time through learning processes and maybe it has an innate core. Um, this is Swiss neuropsychologist uh, Binya Lengenhager. This is something we could all do tonight or you can do at home. You just need a rubber glove and stuff it with cotton. It's an illusion that was discovered in 1998 by Botvinnik and Cohen. And what you do is you have, you can only look at that rubber hand and you put um, the real hand in an invisible position and you stroke them both with Q-tips or brushes. And only if the stroking is synchronous after 20 to 90 seconds, you will get two illusions. One, that that rubber hand you see is part of your own bodily self. You will get a feeling of ownership. But what is more, even more interesting is you will also feel the seen touch in that rubber hand. So you will even have a tactile sensation in that rubber hand and own it. The conscious experience will be one of ownership. And you don't have to think that it is like that. So if you do that, stay with it. Don't giggle and laugh. Uh, don't look into the experimenter's face all the time. Just look at the rubber hand and you will see after 20 to 90 seconds, you will have a strong experience that this is your own hand. So statistics um, from the environment, so to speak. Okay. So the next thing you should do, if you try this with your friends, you should have a hammer ready behind your hand. Right? So as soon as the illusion stands, you want to hit the rubber hand. Why is this interesting? This is not something that has to do with believing something or conscious thought. It shows that the unconscious self model in the brain, so to speak, really believes that this is your hand and immediately tries to protect it if it gets attacked, right? So for scientists, it's interesting. This is not some conscious confabulation. Um, so here's the other example I promised five minutes ago. This is a woman, AZ, who was born in Switzerland um, without arms and legs. She was a cognitively lucid academic with a PhD. Um, and sh ever since she remembers, she has felt phantom limbs, uh, although these arms and legs were never there. And they did an interesting thing. They said on a scale from zero to seven, zero meaning I have no conscious experience, seven meaning how real are those um, phantom limbs if we would say, say your shoulders or your navel are seven, the highest form of realness. 
and you see that the sense of realness varies and you see these parts of the legs, for instance, are about half as real, according to subjective experience, as the real body. You see um, interesting details. For instance, you see that in that body model, in her conscious experience, the three middle toes are not differentiated. Are they differentiated for you now? Do some mindfulness, do some body scan. Can you feel all these three toes individually? Um, most interesting to me is, is that the right hand is more real than the left hand. That right hand has never existed. It was never an input source to the body model in the brain. So how do we explain that? Um, this is Peter Brugger, a uh, famous uh, neuropsychologist in Switzerland, and he did many interesting things with that patient. So one thing you can do, you can tell her, take your phantom fingers and touch your thumb one after the other with your invisible finger. And when you have a conscious experience on, of touching with these two phantom fingers, you tell us. And then you see certain areas in the brain lighting up in the moment of that specific conscious experience. So the self-model really is something in the brain. That's uh, one bottom line of it. They could also give her experiences that she had never had before in her life by zapping her. Like when you knew these areas, you could stimulate these areas in the brain electrically, and then she suddenly had pain experiences in her phantom fingers, which she had never before. Um, so in Western philosophy, the, the question is, what is that a model of? What is that patient's brain actually representing? Aristotle, an older colleague of mine, said that the soul is the form of the body. Aristotle was a naturalist. He assumed that the soul would perish at death with the body. But with these Greek philosophers, the idea was that it was the form principle that held parts together. So as long as these parts were animated and a global shape principle was active, you would be alive, the body would be alive. If that went away, it would disintegrate. So is that what her brain represents? A, glo a global model of body shape, of the body as a whole? Um, Spinoza, many centuries later, said the soul is the idea that the body creates of itself. So you see, we have a, a long tradition in Western philosophy about thinking about these, uh, the relationship between these different levels, and that has a lot to do with the emergence of a conscious self because it is grounded on body representation. So <coughs> we did an experiment in 2007, and that um, went like this. So I have always been very interested uh, in out-of-body experiences because I had someone, some as a young man, and in the context of our meeting, it's also very interesting how does the identification with the body occur in the first place. And um, so I had written in this book, Being No One, I had written, ruined my reputation by writing about out-of-body experiences. This is Olaf Blanke. You've heard about him yesterday. He was the first neurologist to, co uh, um, to cause an out-of-body out experience in 2006 with an electrode in the brain. That's our ingenious uh, Indian technician, Tej Tadi, and that is Binya Lengenhager, whose work this actually was, uh, and you've already seen her. Click one more time. So uh, they came to me and said, we have caused an out-of-body experience. You have written absolutely unintelligible stuff about it. Let's get together. What should we do? And I said, okay, for our philosophical reasons, I want a whole body version of the rubber hand illusion. That's what I want. And then they said, yeah, see, philosophers have no idea. They are completely stupid. This cannot be done because the brain never sees the body from the outside. And then I mumbled something completely crazy about virtualized meta-representation. And I said, these people from the humanities, they're just unintelligible. Wait a minute, we've got a virtual reality lab. And um, then 
we made an experiment that gives you the conscious experience like in this Magritte picture of 1937 where you do a forbidden reproduction of your body and see yourself from behind. Um, just click one more time. And we created something that is called a full body illusion. And the idea in the background was that what we call the sense of self has something to do with a globalized sense of ownership, the experience of owning it all. You know, not only your thoughts and emotions, but the body as well. And it worked like this. You are in a virtual reality lab and you have these goggles on and a camera films you from behind and then a thing called a 3D encoder inserts the image of your body into the virtual reality in front of you. So you see yourself from behind. And then just as in the other experiment, the PhD student comes and starts to stroke your back, just like with the rubber hand. Can you make it louder? Thanks. This is what you see. Okay, stop it there. So after you've had the illusion, your spatial frame of reference is shifted for many minutes. So if people say, just go, um, go, for, go um, to where you have just been standing, you go about 24 centimeters closer to the avatar than to your physical body. Um, this is not an out-of-body experience. It has uh, been over-reported in the press and um, I think there are three elements. The first thing everybody will feel is what we call awkwardness. It gets very weird. The second thing uh, you feel is what we call drift. You feel drawn into the avatar. But it is only few subjects that actually achieve full identification with that avatar, and there are many people working on this right now. So here's another concept that I maybe shouldn't explain in full details. But there is something like a phenomenal unit of uni identification. At any point in time, there is something where you have the conscious experience that you would report as, I am this. This is me. That is what you identify with. So I call it the unit of identification. And these experiments are interesting because they show how we can manipulate the unit of identification. So um, empirically, we know many things. The unit of identification can be tied to a body representation. It can be um, the origins of the first person perspective behind the eyes to the felt body. Um, it can happen without bodily agency, in, without bodily self-control in a passive condition. Um, I can say more uh, about mind wandering if you want to just click. Uh, one more time. Uh, so there are interestingly empirical constraints, things you might not be aware of. There's a subclass of out-of-body experiences which are asomatic, which means there is no body image in the out-of-body experience. People experience themselves as an extensionless pure point floating in space but with a impossible perspective onto the body lying in bed or in an operation theater from the outside. So having a, an explicit body image is not a necessary condition. There are also well-documented bodiless dreams. I don't know if anybody in the audience has ever had one. It's typically during lucid dreams that there is no dream body. You are aware that you're dreaming, but you are just a point in space, but you can control that from which the visual attention is controlled. Um, so that is something we know about selfhood. Um, so there are two distinct classes of um, 
conscious experience where um, there is no explicit body representation. For the unit of identification, explicit embodiment is not a necessary uh, condition. Just localizing you yourself in a here and a now is enough to create a sense of selfhood in some states of consciousness. Um, so is this still embodiment, if you're just a point in space? It's a borderline condition. Um, I'll tell you another empirical constraint. If one wants to be uh, intellectually honest today, uh, and just face the empirical evidence, one has to face the fact that by direct brain stimulation, it is possible to ma move the unit of identification out of the body. So here is a brief report. The patient had the experience within one second after the initiation of stimulation. His perception of disembodiment always involved a location about 50 centimeter behind his body and off to the left. So the environment was still visually perceived from his real person perspective, not from the disembodied perspective. So you can leave the whole visual model as it is. You have the feeling it looks out of these eyes, but where it's selfie, the sense of self, can be moved out of the head back in. You put 40 millivolts, a very s small current, on again. You move the sense of self out of the head, still keeping the visual perspective. That is something one has to know if one wants to say something about the self today. Um, so there is a way of disembodiment uh, without seeing yourself. The unit of identification and the origin of the visual spatial perspective can be dissociated. The unit of identification can be outside of the conscious body model and there is not what is called a perceptually impossible perspective as we have it in classical out-of-body experience. If somebody sees themselves from above in an operation theater or after an accident. Mm. So here's one last uh, example. Um, it looks in these in robotic re-embodiment studies that the self of self can already also be split in two or smeared in space. How does that work? So um, this is an experiment by a young woman in Barcelona. So imagine you are here, you have these goggles on. This is the robot which you are remote controlling, right? You look through the robot's eyes. Uh, you just stand and then you walk to a first mirror and then you see yourself out of the eyes of a robot walking to a mirror which leads to a strong identification um, with the robot's body and the visual perspective. Then you turn left and you go to the second mirror. Um, maybe click one more time. And uh, then they come and ask you questions even, you know. You have to ask, answer questions about where your sense of self is right now. But of course, they hold the questionnaire to the robot's face. Um, so you see yourself in the mirror, and then the second, that's called the induction phase, when you're fully identified with the robot, you just turn around and look at what? Yourself, the physical body that is controlling this motion right now. And um, I'll leave the complicated scientific details out. If you look at the statistic, the sense of where am I, what am I, can be split into. There is something like bilocation. So it's fully manipulable. Okay, keep going. So um, this is how it is called. The second me, seeing the real body during humanoid robot embodiment, produces an illusion of bilocation, which is actually, they, they talk about illusion too, you know. <laughs> we come back to this. Um, keep going. So um, what we learn from this uh, is that the sense of selfhood can be smeared in the space of conscious experience, and in some subjects it can even be duplicated. And that's very strange. It's hard. I don't know if you can imagine having the sense of self duplicated, because the essence of it seems to be that it is one. 
So open questions are, should one believe these autophenomenological reports or are people maybe giving wrong answers to the question? Does that we simply cannot imagine something like this mean that it's conceptually impossible? But still, is a duplication of the sense of self conceivable? So I come to these researchers and I say, yeah, 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 you know, they're, we're in California where these tech evangelists are and there's, you know, up in the Bay Area, there's all this mortality denial, uploading the self into cyberspace and we'll all be immortal and there's this new religion emerging, you know, all these uh, people's uh, religion as a marketing strategy. And uh, no, no, keep going. And they also all want to upload the self. They talk a lot about it in California. In Europe, we do it, right? Uh, in California, uh, they think it'll work. Uh, uh, but I tell those scientists it will never work because the human self model is grounded in the physical body. It's anchored in gut feelings, for instance, in emotional affective states. So you can't just copy it out into a large computer and they listen to me and then they do this. There's another version of the experiment already you know. So you see an avatar, but this time the avatar has a silhouette just like in this video that goes on and off. Now if one synchronizes this going on and off with your unconsciously felt heartbeat, then it gets very strong. Then the identification gets uh, pretty good and strong. So they actually take something that is inside of you the internal self model and make it visible in virtual reality as an external part of reality. Just to give you a flavor which way this research goes. There are many experiments now. That's the one you have seen. This is Swedish uh, researcher Henrik Ersson has done this one. It works very well too. You get stroked on the chest while sitting and then you have the feeling you jump back behind your body. If you film people from above and put them on a table like this. Interestingly, some will drop out of the physical body as it were. Others will float up. You can imagine that for these neuroscientists, it's very interesting to see what is different in the brain between the up people and the down people. Um, keep going for a bit. So there's all this fun, fancy stuff, you know, they can do this in brain scanners today and look at differences. Um, they have robots doing the stroking really precisely. Um, here you see your crazy philosopher controlling an avatar. So I wear something like a diving suit and I have sensors and I'm being filmed by 18 infrared cameras. And then you can just move, it's called motion tracking, and um, move a virtual body in virtual space. One time I remember the PhD student, she likes salsa dancing as her hobby and I caught her in a coffee break. She put 16 copies of, their, of herself in virtual reality and another 16 on top, on standing on their head and then she was dancing salsa with 32 to, uh, copies of herself. So this is uh, where it's going, you know. Um, <laughs> keep uh, um, going. So one last empirical um, example for what I mean by a self-model before we come uh, to the end then. Um, so here is one experiment. This self-model theory of subjectivity is not just some philosophical theory. It makes empirical predictions. One prediction would be that if there's something like a self-model in your brain, there could not only be brain-computer interfaces, but there could be self-model interfaces. You could connect the self-model in your brain to artificial worlds, to virtual reality, to artificial body images, or to um, robots, for instance. Now, I'll just give you one example of a study. It's not my own work at all. That was done in Israel. So you have somebody who is in a scanner and the computer system reads out in a very complicated pr um, process what um, is happening in the person's brain and classifies these um, data and turns them into motor commands. So um, you can just lie there and imagine that you're moving your right arm. And you can imagine that you're moving your left arm. 
and you can imagine that you're shuffling your feet and you can use this as commands for turn right, turn left, walk ahead and send this to a robot or an avatar and this motor imagery and turn it into bodily motions while looking through the system's eyes. Let's have a look at how this works. I just want to get you, give you a feeling of where this empirical re research goes. Must be really loud now. Bing. That's where you are. That is 4,000 kilometers away. That's what you see. walking the robot, right? So you see, rubber hands can be embedded into what you experience at your, as your conscious self. Avatars can be embedded and coupled through what you experience as your own self. Um, robots are nothing but complex tools. There are um, additional physical uh, objects that you can control directly out of the brain bypassing the non-neural body as it were. So you can imagine if this, this doesn't work, you know, this is not real time, this is not a closed loop, this is not fluid in any sense, but give this technology one or two decades, we may be living in a very different world. But the interesting question for us is of course what this tells us about the nature of selfhood. And one bottom line is, the nature of selfhood has to do with controlling something and when you successfully control something like a body, biological or artificial, then you get the sense of selfhood. Ownership has a lot to do with successful control. Okay. Um, now back to philosophy and what we're really interested in and there's one last concept from philosophy you have to learn. And that concept is called transparency. Uh, a representation is transparent if you cannot experience it um, as a representation. Let's look at that. So this is a famous um, British philosopher, G. E. Moore, and for the experts in the room, the technical definition of transparency is only content properties of a conscious representation are available for introspection. So the idea is, this is not a lectern. This is an active model in your visual cortex right now. But if you introspect your experience, you can just see what it is a model of. You just see a lectern. You don't see the brain processes that construct it. You're completely blind to the construction process. You just get, just like on a desk, computer desktop, you don't see the workings of the computer. You just see the mouse pointer, that's you, uh, and the waste paper basket and the user surface. So the idea is if it's a good model, you don't, it's a great success of natural evolution of mother nature. If it's a good model, you don't have the feeling it's a model anymore. This is relevant in the context of case teaching if we want to ask ourselves what is actually direct perception or what is immediate perception. Keep going. So, so um, I don't know why this comes, keep going. Uh, so it's an article I wrote in the Expert ha Oxford, Oxford Handbook of the Self. There are many ways in which we can claim that there is no such thing as a self. 
The classical, I think, boring way is the metaphysical thesis, the self is not a substance. This means a substance is an entity that could stand in existence all by itself, even if all other existing entities were to disappear. Anil said that yesterday, if the brain was dead, the body was dead. So if the self was ontologically self-subsistent, it could exist after death independently of the brain. Everything we empirically know today points to the fact that selves are not self-subsistent entities. They do not endure over time. You don't have one in dreamless deep sleep. And they do not belong to the basic blo building blocks of reality. They are a high-level phenomenon. The sense of a self is a very high-level phenomenon. It's not something basic. Keep going. Much more interesting is methodological anti-realism about the self, because that's really saying and obvious. Nothing in the scientific investigation of self-consciousness commits us to assume the existence of individual selves. The process of generating and testing new hypotheses in empirical research programs, agency, self-cognition, simply does not require the assumption of anything like a self. Prediction, testing, and explanation can take place in a much more parsimonious conceptual framework, for instance, by introducing the concept of a transparent self-model. And that will be the last point. So let us keep looking at it. What is a transparent self-model? If we apply this idea of transparency not to the lectern, but to the self-model, it's an integrated internal representation of the animal as a whole. It's not a thing or a representation of a thing that we call the self, but it's an ongoing process of tracking global features of the system which you are. It, in our own case, this uses a body model. Keep going. Um, we can consciously experience the content of that body model but we cannot di direct our introspective attention to the construction process in the brain. If we want an evolutionary theory of what it means to be an embodied self, that is the main thing I would claim we have to understand what a transparent self model is. And keep going, there's more to read. You don't want to know this. Um, but just back to the concept of transparency. We do not see the window if the window is clean, but only the bird flying by. We do not see the neurons firing away in our brain, but only what they represent for us, this lectern, this bodily self. We are unaware of the medium through which information reaches us. That's what transparency means. Consciousness is an invisible interface. So for conscious states, this means normally all data structures in the brain are activated so fast that you don't see the activation process. You just get the final result, table, lectern, my face. Second empirical hypothesis is in evolution, it was not necessary to experience that all of this is a model. It would have cost us much more sugar we would have had to find, it would, the computational load in the brain would be much higher to not only know there's a lectern there, but also know there's a lectern model active in my brain right now. In evolution, it was important to know there's a wolf there, but not have another image that says, oh, in my mind, there is a mo wolf model active right now, and it might be true or false. Those people were not our ancestors. You know, um, they got sorted out very quickly. So there are some empirical ideas of why we are naive realists, why we think we are directly in contact with reality. Now one has, and that's actually the last step, to apply this constraint to the self-model. We are systems which are not able to recognize their own non-subsymbolic means has nothing to do with thought, has nothing to do with language self-model as a model. That's why we will operate under something that we might call a naive realistic self-misunderstanding. By necessity, and this is not a false opinion or something like that, 
we experience ourselves as being in direct and immediate contact with ourselves. There's a phenomenology of identification, the attachment, right? That falls out if you apply transparency to the self model. By necessity, you will be attached to, say, desires, hopes, fears that are integrated in the self model if you cannot experience them as representations. And that is why they become so robust. That is why they become so causally effective. So the bottom line is that if an organism has a conscious self model but is not able to experience it as a model, it will be fully enslaved, so to speak. It will identify, it will attach to the content of the self model. It will be forced to act it out. In a sense, the organism will be enslaved by the conscious self model in its brain. So just a general idea, any conscious system that operates under a transparent self model will by necessity experience itself as being someone. And that is what I'm actually interested in, is if there are no selves, if there are just bodies, where does this robust experience of being someone, where does it come from? We have to explain it. So uh, that what we call the conscious self is the transparent representation of the whole organism in the brain. You might also call it the transparent avatar in your brain. So the question is, is the self an illusion? And we've been there yesterday. So from the policeman's perspective, this question is conceptual nonsense because it already presupposes a knowing self. There is no little man in your head. There is no one in the system who could have an illusion. What really exists is a transparent conscious model of the self. So many people in conscious experience imagine it a little bit like this. There's some sort of inner screen, the neural correlate of consciousness, and there's a little man sitting there and he watches the screen, right? And if the screen is an illusion, then a little man has an illusion because it watches something false, right? But in philosophy, can you click one more time? We know that it cannot be like this we call it the homunculus fallacy. Because if there was a little man watching that image of the world in your brain, that little man would have mental states too. It would have a perception too. There would be a screen in a little man's head. And it ha would have to go on infinitely like that. My claim is that Mother Nature solved this problem by making the self model transparent. So you just fully identify it with it, reify it as you want, turn it into a solid thing, something that was never there. You turn a process, a dynamic process, into a unit of identification, and then you get, don't get entangled in this. Um, so is the self an illusion? Any system which is unable to experience its own self model as a model will be forced to identify itself with the content of this model. There is no little man in the head. There's no one in the system who could have an illusion. The only thing that really exists is a transparent conscious self model. And I think I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>